you glad we have an everlasting God? Oh, run around and find somebody that you don't recognize and introduce yourself, and if you know them and well, hug their necks. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not think you won't grow weary. You are defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up. Oh, we praise you, Lord, that that is so. Man, you, uh, uh, you've opened your heart not to us, but to, not just to us, but to the whole world, Lord. And your invitation is, is that we might draw near and experience the fullness of you. And you use us, Lord, to extend that invitation everywhere. Uh, Lord, we can't do it in our own strength. Pour it to Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh, afresh that we might truly worship you in spirit and truth. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Hey, take a seat. Take a look at the bulletin. Um, um, some significant things c coming up. Irene, do you want to speak to the uh, Veterans Barbecue? Well, yeah, yeah, why don't you come up here if you got a extended thing. Good morning, church. Good morning. So um, this weekend is our Women of Grace on Saturday at 9.30. And next potluck so it's next sunday is the veterans potluck so we're having it right after service and we're going to have grilled hot dogs and hamburgers i'm going to make beans jerry cr is providing potato salad so if you guys will bring just salads or desserts that would be great we'd appreciate it and i hope everybody can attend 
appreciate our veterans. Amen. I think that's it. That's it? Yeah. Okay. We're having Reese's Pieces potato salad. <laughs> no, we're not. All right. <laughs> no, we're not. All right. It's Reese's potato salad. Okay. Oh, man. Okay, um, uh, you'll see in, in the little box on the, on the left side of the bulletin, uh, next week we're gathering at, at 6.30 after the Veterans Barbecue to join with the Harvest India USA community via Zoom to pray for uh, Harvest India. Shresh Kumar, I think, will be on the call with us. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Harvest India, we, we've been partnering with Shresh for many, many years. A number of us went to India about 15 years ago. And we're just inundated with uh, uh, elder care homes, orphanages, leper colonies, uh, outreach to the uh, the red light district, just all kinds of stuff. And so it's every penny spent, every, every penny gifted to Harvest City is just is tremendous. And so we'll be gathering to get get an update, see how things are going there uh, in India. That'll be next Sunday at 6:30. Uh, and we are gathering uh, tonight to continue walking with the Lord through the Upper Room Discourse, John 15. We're going to try to get to John 15, 10 last week. We'll be there this week. Um, uh, let's see. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Harvest India? Yes, yes. Christy. Okay, thanks, Christy. Okay, anything else? Okay, um, today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. So it's going to be a little bit different service. I got two different videos that we're going to be watching. Uh, the first comes from the Voice of the Martyrs, uh, which which tells a, what one gal's story, uh, and that's a briefer video. And then I've got a longer video. I interview a uh, friend of mine, Jerry Anzi, who uh, works with us at the International Leadership Institute. He's from Nigeria. I'll let him tell his story, uh, and then we'll. Go, go to prayer, and our prayer will focus on the international, uh, on Nigeria especially. Uh, and Chris wanted me to extend a trigger warning, um, uh, fairly graphic descriptions of, of persecution that, uh, that Jerry's going to share. Uh, he, of course, he, he's, he's sharing stories. So just, just be mindful of that for, uh, for tender ears. Um, Chris thinks junior hires might have tender ears, so just just keep keep that in mind. Finally, it is Julie's birthday. She's 39 years old today. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Julie. Happy birthday to you. All right. Uh, Carol, you have an announcement? Well, Carol, yes. Does anybody have a word from the Lord? Carol? Yeah, please come up. Yeah. I know. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, you know, God takes care of me every day, and I thank him every day for taking care. In my devotions this morning, um, it's from Jeremiah 19, 3 to 6, and 14, 15. Jeremiah prophesied, they have built 
the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Something, something I did not command or mention. Jeremiah is speaking to what God told him. Nor did it enter my mind. So beware, the days are coming. Topheth or the valley of Ben Hinnom. In Greek, this valley of Hinnom is known as Gehenna. Jesus compared hell, Gehenna, to the fire that burns continuously in that valley. The valley of Hinnom, or Gehenna, is synonymous with hell, the place of eternal punishment. Jeremiah 19.3, listen, I'm going to bring a disaster on this place. In 1979, archaeologist Gabriel Barquet unearthed two small silver scrolls. It took years to delicately unroll the metal scrolls, and each was found to contain a Hebrew etching of the blessing from Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Scholars date the scrolls to the 7th century B.C. They're the oldest known bits of scripture in the world. And the reason I wanted to uh, praise God today is because my heater went out Friday. I called every single air conditioning heater place in Tehachapi. Everyone's booked up till the end of the month. But my sweet little Jerry, where are you, Jerry? Right here. I'm never sitting here. He has someone I can call. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. And thank you, Jerry. All right. Uh, We're going to be, I mean, just kind of a glimpse behind the curtain. We'll be bouncing back and forth between Zoom and the songs on the on the screen uh, once or twice. So if there's a hitch in the get along with the words, don't yell at Chad. There's computer stuff, so just know uh, that's happening. Uh, We're going to sing uh, uh, with Jerry uh, redeemed. then I'll excuse kids for uh, Children's Church. We'll watch the videos, and then we'll lift up uh, the persecuted church, represent uh, Nigeria representing the persecuted church everywhere. Okay. So come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. And kindle on us the fire of your love. You know, I don't know what went through your mind or what was going through your mind you accepted Christ as your personal Savior. I guess everybody's got a different story. Seems like all I could see was the struggle. Haunted by ghosts that live in my Bound up in shackles with all of my failures Wondering how long is this gonna last So you look at this prisoner Say to me, son, stop fighting a fight that's already been won. I am redeemed. And you are redeemed. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain. Well, I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. All my life, I'm 
When I hear you whisper, child, lift up your head. I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. I am redeemed. And you are redeemed. So I'll shake off these heavy chains. Wipe away every stain Cause I'm not who I used to be Because I don't have to be The old man inside of me Cause his days are long dead and gone Because I got a new name A new life, I'm not the same And I hope that will carry me home I am redeemed. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain, because I'm not who I used to be. Oh God, I'm not who I used to be. Jesus, I'm not who I used to be, because I am redeemed. Are you redeemed? Lift your hand up. I am redeemed. Thank God redeemed. Glory. Praise God. Chad, and you can transition to Zoom. Uh, two videos, and I'll introduce them uh, both. Uh, right now, the first comes from uh, Voice of the Martyrs, which, which tells the story of, of Rebecca, uh, which is, as you, unfortunately, it's a fairly common story, not just in Nigeria, but uh, many places uh, around the world. And then we'll, uh, the second video will be, will be Jerry uh, Angie who had to uh, flee Nigeria about three years ago, and you'll hear uh, his story. Then what we'll do, we'll re receive the Lord's offering, uh, and then we'll go, go into prayer. And Jerry asks for four specific prayers for Nigeria, and I'll just inter remind us of each one. And if a couple of you will pray out loud, in a nice loud voice in Zoom, you can pray, of course, uh, at home. Uh, We'll move through those those prayers, and then we'll uh, continue on. Okay. Are we there? My name is Rebecca. I live in the north of Nigeria. One evening I was out with my daughter and on our way home we saw smoke rising above our village. We were under attack. There was nothing we could do to defend ourselves. My Some members of our church gave us a wedding gift. It was a Bible. We read it together, every day. On the day our village burnt to the ground, my husband and my son were killed in the attack. Some of us were able to return to our village to reclaim anything that was left.
parts of Genesis and Revelation were burnt, but the rest was mostly intact. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like a wild flower. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. I still use this Bible. It reminds me of God's faithfulness. Naked I came from my mother's womb, but naked I shall return there. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord is a husband to all widows. I look to him for every need. This is what I am still holding on to. Hey Kyle, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. Good to see you, man. Yeah, good to connect. It was good to see you yesterday too. Yeah, not going to take much much of your time. Sunday's okay. an international day of prayer for the persecuted uh, persecuted church, and uh, Voice of the Martyrs is featuring a video uh, in Nigeria. And I thought, hey, I know our Nigerian. <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah. flesh this out a little bit. Yeah, so, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and in, in your role with ILI? Well, uh, my name, my full name is uh, Jerry Anze. I'm originally from the city of Jos in central Nigeria. Um, I served with the International Leadership Institute while in Nigeria for 11 years. And we had the privilege of training leaders all across the country. Uh, we trained over 11,000 plus leaders across Nigeria. And when we moved to the US, um, you know, I continued serving with ILI in the U.S. Why? I am married. My wife is Leticia. She's originally from Rwanda. So when we got married, we moved. Um, she moved to Nigeria where we live. And uh, we're blessed with three children. Mandisa's nine. She's in the fifth grade. Jaden is seven and he's in the second grade. Nathan is three and he's in pre-K three. Also, <laughs> I serve in the global executive team uh, in charge of the Horn West and the Horn of Africa. So mm -hmm. I have seven countries that I directly oversee, uh, which includes Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea, uh, Nigeria, Liberia, Ghana, and the Gambia. So I oversee the operations of ILI in those nations, uh, working with uh, the local leadership there in providing training, multiplication, and just continuous growth. Yeah, and it, and it sounds like a lot, but and it yeah. is a lot. But the really good news is that I, ILI is a really has a decentralized model. Yeah. Where, where right. The goal is to raise up leaders who will yeah. in turn equip leaders. So yeah. it's not all on your shoulders, but you've got faithful leaders working with you, That's both right. online and, and in those other nations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you've been in the U.S. for, what, two or three years now? Three years. Yeah, three years. Yeah. Hmm. Tell, tell that story. What prompted you to, to get, get out of Nigeria and, and, and come to Georgia? Um, so because of the work, the nature of the work I do in training, especially in northern Nigeria, and uh, my rising profile as a, an emerging Christian leader, 
uh, at a point made my life and that of my family uh, at risk. Uh, there are places that we ordinarily couldn't go again because there was a crackdown on Christian workers, on targeting pastors, missionaries, and people like me and what we do. So you become a prime target. They're targeting you. They're targeting your family, uh, either attacking you directly or trying to, um, to, to kill you or uh, kidnap your kids. So large scale child kidnapping was happening at the time uh, that we left. And uh, also because we couldn't go to some places in Northern Nigeria where we've done training, we've done some short term mission work and we have a strong presence there, but I can't even go there because of the dangers, um, the Islamic dangers and attack against, uh, against Christians. So for that reason, my family was at great risk of either being kidnapped or myself being a potential target. So I, I needed to leave and get a place that is safe uh, enough for my family and especially my kids to, uh, to leave. I was reluctant coming to the US, uh, but Wes, uh, our president encouraged me. I sent my family first. They, they came in while I, I was still doing a training. Uh, just before I left, I, I did a training just two or three days before I left and finally came into the U.S. And seven days after I arrived, there was total lockdown. COVID happened and there was mm. lockdown. So wow. those were uh, some of the things that happened that uh, made us to, to leave and seek for safety here uh, in the U.S. Prior to that, I have been personally attacked uh, in, in, in 2013. Uh, I was attacked at home and uh, I survived it. I mean, that I'm alive today was is a miracle. I was almost, I was literally almost killed, you know, but uh, I survived it. I've been into very tough um, places, you know, to teach ILI uh, and, and to do short-term missions. It's a risky place. Nigeria is one of the most difficult places for you to be a Christian today. Well, I understand Joss is kind of right on the the dividing line between the Muslim yeah. North and the Christian South in Nigeria, correct? That's correct. So we call it the middle belt, like the belt you use, because it kind of connects the North from the South. Now, in Northern Nigeria, uh, it's predominantly Muslim. There are places where you have Christian presence. There are places where there are more Christians, but again, because of the uh, because of Islamic dominance, they claim, you know, to just they, they claim to be more in those areas. But there are states that have more Christians, but then they're being suppressed by Islamists. Now they've been pushing towards the city of Jos, and Jos is like a buffer zone. So they've been trying to push towards Jos and go to other parts of the country, the South, the East, and you know, and the West. And they've always gotten resistance around this belt, you know, because Jaws has a very strong Christian history. Um, uh, the early missionaries established a lot of Christian presence in the city of Jaws. So Jaws is a place of interest for them. And the name Jos, J-O-S, stands for Jesus, our Savior. So it's known as, um, as a Christian state. And therefore, they've tried to override this state to take it over and Islamize it. But they've always had that resistance for a very, very long time. So what they do is go to uh, local villages in rural areas and begin to uh, attack those villages. I can share several stories with you about some of these attacks that we were personally involved in after the attack happened. Uh, about 15 minutes away from where we lived in, in Jaws before we moved here, there was an attack that happened. They came into this village and they killed over a hundred women and children. Now, why women and children? In that community, they have a place that is like a safe, uh, safe hiding place in the community. In case of any attack, they send the women and children to that safe place and the men try to confront the situation. 
So not knowing that the enemy knew about that safe place. So as these enemies came into the village in the middle of the night, people were asleep, 2 a.m. They started shooting, you know, sporadically in the air. So people were thinking, hey, there's problem. They heard the gunshot, they knew there was problem. So they began to send the women and the children to the safe place to keep them safe while they tried to figure out how to deal with this enemy, not knowing that they were sending the women and the, and the children to the lion's den. Those guys were waiting. As they were going, they were butchering these women and these children. That is one. Another church that is maybe 40, about 40 minutes away from where we lived was also attacked on a Sunday morning. About 80 worshipers were worshiping in the church, including the pastors. These guys came, surrounded the church, locked up the doors and windows, set it on fire, and everybody died in that. Nobody escaped. Nobody was arrested. So those are the kind of attacks that they've been doing. And then I can go on and on for we, something. So ILI heard about this and said, hey, how can we help these people? We're talking about over 100 people. So we decided to do a major project as International Leadership Institute to help these people. I cannot travel there. It's about seven hours from Joss. I couldn't go there. So we got 100 women who are now widows because their husbands were killed. We brought them to the city of Joss in a Christian um, in a Christian guest house. We kept them there for one week. Uh, and then we got a ministry, no ILI training. We just want to be, just love on them and be there with them in this situation. So we got a ministry who does trauma counseling and those things. So they came and they administered counseling for these women for these days. It was a very difficult moment for me personally. Yeah. We've heard about these attacks, but this was a moment where I was face to face for one week with victims who, I mean, with people who were victims of Boko Haram attacks. So we did a, we did that for them, and then we got we helped got some humanitarian things for them, food and warm clothing and seedlings and some seed money, and then we send them back home uh, with security to ensure that they got home. So that is a little bit of the situation you find in Nigeria. It's as difficult as it is. And like I said, in Northern Nigeria, it is a tough place to be a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we know there's persecution all over the world, but certainly in Nigeria. How can we pray for the nation of Nigeria, Jerry? Yeah, let's pray specifically for Boko Haram. Boko Haram is the terrorist group that is terrorizing Nigeria. Let us pray that God is just going to cause a mighty revival to happen amongst this group of people. Right. There are so many people that are in captivity. There are school children that were kidnapped, you know, by this Boko Haram. They are still in captivity. Let us pray for their release. Think about the pain, the torture, the emotional torture and trauma that their parents are going through to be away from, from their kids for over a year. So let's pray for the safe release and return of these children back uh, to their homes. And let's also pray for Northern Nigeria, that God will help the missionaries that are working and serving in those difficult places uh, to stay strong and to keep pushing on in the face of this uh, persecution that they experience. More than anything else, we have uh, elections coming uh, up in February, and this will be a defining moment for Nigeria, that mm. God will help elect a righteous person that will begin uh, to restore the nation and end this insecurity that's happening in the country. All right. Hey, Jerry, Grace Fellowship of Tehachapi is going to go right to prayer after watching this video, and we will be lifting up those concerns, brother. Hey, Thank thanks you. for sharing with this man. It's, you know, it makes a real difference to know somebody who's been there, who's done what, what you've done, and it's great to be in partnership with you through, uh, through ILI. And look, I look forward to, you know, work, working with you into the future, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate my love to the family. You and bet, to the man. church family, please. You betcha. God, yeah. God bless you. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. All right. Okay.
Jerry. Uh, so, so as we continue, we, we're going to receive the Lord's offering as we sing hymn number 740, uh, 743, Christ for the World, we sing, and then we'll, uh, we'll go into prayer. Re remember the four focuses of prayer, and let the Lord be stirring your heart. Uh, the first is for Boko Haram, that's the is Islamic mil uh, militants uh, from northern Nigeria. Pray that revival breaks out. Chad, give me some lights. Uh, that, uh, that that revival breaks out and, and that the Lord reaches them. Uh, second is is for those uh, those kids who have been abducted for over over a year, that the that Boko Haram would release them, come for the families. Uh, third, uh, for the missionaries and Christian workers in northern Nigeria who continue to serve in, a, in that very very difficult place, and then for upcoming elections in in February. So have those things in mind as we see the Lord's tithes and offerings. Yeah, Terry? The return of the children, yeah, who have been uh, abducted. Christ for the world we sing, 700 and... Okay, hold on, 700 and... What is it? 43, thank you. Christ for the world we sing. You see it? Chad, and you got it ready to go? Very good. Chad, there you go. Okay, let's let's continue a prayer, and I would just invite just a couple of you to lift up your voice, maybe stand up so we can all share in your prayer as we pray for those uh, four concerns that Jerry has has brought to us, and then I'll I'll close this up and we'll share in the Lord's prayer as we continue. Um, the first prayer is for 
for the Lord to send revival to Boko Haram, that, uh, that, that they might come to the Lord. A couple of you would pray. Lord, for the hundreds of children who've been abducted, that they might be returned safely to their families. For the missionaries and Christian workers serving in northern uh, Nigeria, where the persecution is so intense. for upcoming elections in uh, February.
And Lord, I would lift up other uh, faithful leaders with the International Leadership Institute, Martin Durham, as he leads the team in Europe, uh, Lord, reaching out, continuing to reach out to the refugees who are fleeing the war uh, in Ukraine. Um, just can, Lord, for um, David Thagana uh, in, in East Africa, as, as uh, on, on his on that side of that huge continent, Lord, in, interacting with uh, Islam as well, that uh, that you would give him wisdom, Lord, for, uh, for Paul Lau in uh, Southeast Asia, Lord, uh, Lord, the, Lord, the ongoing work there with the with the with the Burmese. Uh, Thailand, just uh, just all over that space, Lord, that, uh, that you would do a great work uh, through through Paul, uh, Lord, for Senor Ramirez uh, as he's reaching out, uh, Lord, in uh, Latin America, Lord, faithful men and women who are uh, equipping uh, leaders who live there, uh, folks who know their culture who know the dangers, who know the issues. Lord, uh, I pray that you would uh, keep, keep them safe as they continue to, uh, Lord, to serve you, to, uh, gosh, to, uh, to ignite your church with, with a passion that comes from your heart for, for, for the hurting and, and the broken that are, that are within reach. And Lord, we would continue to pray for Jerry uh, as, as he's responsible for those, I mean, those countries uh, he named, every one of them, just tough, tough places. Uh, Lord, that, uh, that you would keep him encouraged and you're bringing Yosef Sarkis in mind, uh, North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, gosh, as he's done training uh, all over uh, uh, Iran and Liberia, and, I mean, uh, Libya and Egypt and tough, tough places, Lord, encourage them and pray that you would extend your kingdom work through these uh, faithful men and women. Lord, in this Sunday for the Persecuted Church, Lord, we, uh, uh, we do pray for those faithful ones all around the world who are suffering in ways we can't even uh, imagine. And pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would encourage them, comfort them, Preserve them, Lord, that uh, uh, they might continue that faithful, faithful witness where you've planted them. Lord, we know you hear us, for we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray when you said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Hey, I encourage you to open your Bibles to Psalm 51 before we share together in the Lord's Supper. Um, just a powerful powerful call to recollection through confession as, as we recognize our, our desperate need for the Lord. It's easy on a day like the you know, prayer for the International, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church to, to fall into an us and them you know, trap. You know, we're, we're the white hats, they're the black hats. You know, sick them, Lord, that kind of prayer. Except... For Jesus, who died not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And uh, this, this intense prayer that, that David prays, uh, Psalm 51. Oops, that's right. Follow along as I read Psalm 51. Uh, the heading of the psalm to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. 
For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness. Guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud for your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you delight, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and right offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered offered on your altar. Oh man, this this it's amazing. It really is. In in the annals of ancient history, uh, you know, from the heart of, of the national um, archives of this ancient people, Israel, comes this this personal lament, this, this cry of, of confession and desire from restoration that comes from the great king of Israel, King David. And as we uh, quickly move through this psalm, what uh, uh, my goal, goal today is just equip us for confession as we come to the Lord's Supper uh, the, this morning uh, through this powerful, powerful psalm. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Ah, The story, the the background story of this great psalm is in 2 Samuel beginning in in chapter 11. Just to bring it fresh to mind, uh, uh, David, he's he's safe in this capital, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, he sent his army with Joab uh, to war, at, and he's frankly bored. It's as if he has nothing to do. He goes on the rooftop. He sees Bathsheba, who is uh, cleansing herself from uh, um, having just menstruated. Uh, this was a ritual cleansing act that she was going on. We just walked through this uh, a few months ago uh, in our Wednesday morning Bible study. One of the most dramatic uh I'll say bits in world literature, just the intensity uh, of the story. He calls for Bathsheba. He, uh, he sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant. Uh, Uriah, her husband, in fact, he calls for Uriah, her husband, to come back from the war. Uriah was named as one of, mighty, one of uh, David's mighty men. He, he, he was a, 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 a trusted a lieutenant. Of David's, he tries to get Uriah to go home and sleep with Bathsheba, his wife, but he will not because his his, his companions are, are at war, uh, and so David is frustrated, and so he sends a note through Uriah. He gives the note to 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 Uriah to take to to take to Joab, to tell Joab to attack the walls. Uh, of the city, and then withdraw the troops so that Uriah will be exposed and killed. And that's precisely what, what happens. So it, it appears as if Uriah had come, had come home, had slept with, uh, with, with, with his wife, and Bathsheba was pregnant with Uriah's husband. That's the narrative that, uh, that David wanted to spin wanted to spend, spin, except that God knew the truth. And Nathan the prophet comes to David and tells a story 
of a rich man who had a who had plenty of sheep, and a guest came to the rich man's house, and the rich man took uh, uh, the little lamb of, of of a poor neighbor and slaughtered that that lamb, and it made David irate, and David was just moving for justice, and I love that picture right there. David takes his, Nathan takes the bony finger of judgment and says, you are the man, and David is undone. He's caught in his sin. He's caught in the lie of of the cover-up, and that triggers this psalm of confession. This, This movement of true recollection. Remember, recollection is that first movement of prayer where, where we gather ourselves before God, where we take the time to, to put forth the effort to, you know, to, uh, uh, to get square with God. And we talk about the act of confession. That's really what's going on. We're, we're gathering ourselves honestly be before the God of creation. And this is, is by no means a I intend to be an, an, exhaust, an exhaustive kind of movements of confession, but it's certainly what David goes through. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever be, uh, before me. Authentic c- contrition. Not blame shifting, not, not making excuses. Here I am. I am undone in, in the foolishness of my sin, that authentic contrition. I have great clarity about what I have done before you, O God. My transgression is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now this is interesting. Ever, Ever since I first read Psalm 51, what 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 do you mean against you only have I sinned? How about Uriah? How about Uriah's family? But what David is, is naming is that an, an etern- it's an eternal violation. And whenever we violate one another, you know, when uh, whenever we cross a boundary, do something uh, we ought not to do, you know, it's it's never a, you know a small thing. It's always a violation of what God intends, of God's clarity of a right way of being in the world. Uh, and even, even this, the smallest violation, not only does it hinder what the Lord wants to do in our lives, but in our family's lives and, in, and indeed the whole world. So as David is recognizing his sin and authentic contrition, he also recognizes that it's an eternal violation. As a spiritual being, it's never a small thing. And before God, he owns that. He recognizes that. So that you may just that so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Simple affirmation. God, you are the faithful God. God, you are true. God, you are just. And God, you must establish your righteousness in creation. That's, you know, the responsibility lies with him. I I was thinking about this in the time that, uh, the uh, the event that that connected us to uh, uh, Three Angels Orphanage in in Haiti. I was trying to, it's around 2012. When, when, when was the earthquake in, in Haiti? Anybody remember? Anybody mark that? It was about two, 2012, 2013. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, and Port-au-Prince, the capital essentially collapsed. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of people who, who died in, in that in that earthquake, uh, it was 2010, and, uh, uh, and and a good friend who was an expert in in concrete, he's a concrete guy. He just happened to be 
in uh, at Three Angels uh, a couple weeks before the, uh, the earthquake and made sure that the, the cistern had water. It, it was it was it was a it was a, a divine yeah appointment and and, and he recognized. And, and he went back after the earthquake, concrete expert, and he realized that the uh, the building standards were were not observed all over Port Port-au-Prince. I mean, uh, uh, the government palace, the, the Capitol building, all the major buildings, homes all over the place. I, concrete, okay. If, is Oscar here? Oscar knows he's a concrete guy. One part cement, two parts sand. Three parts gravel, that 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 makes concrete. In order to save money, they remove the cement, much of the cement, and so and so when the stress of the earthquake came, it was like a, it was like a sandcastle, and and buildings were collapsing all over the city, and that's why the depth was was so high. Who's to account? For Failure, I mean, never bad mouth. How you know, um, uh, you know, uh, the planning department inspectors who are making sure that the builder is holding to the business codes. I mean, the the, uh, uh, the building codes. That wasn't going on in Haiti. There was now there, uh, there was no accountability for the for you know for the very physical structure of the community. And thousands and thousands died. What David is affirming, God, you are just. You are the divine building inspector who makes sure that, that, that we function according to design in order to keep things safe. Simple affirmation of who God is and who his role and, and, and what his role is. Five, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. What in the world does he mean by that? Very simply, David is recognizing the cosmic crisis of a fallen world. Sin is not merely, you know, something that you know that that plagues us as individuals. Sin is 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 in the very fabric of reality because the man and the woman. Walked away from God and refused, and, and thought they could be wise outside of a relationship with God, and it put this wicked twist in the very fabric of reality. So that crazy things happen all the time. So that there's that there is violation, that there is injustice, that 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 there is harm, and so as as David is is owning his own personal transgression. He, he, he's recognizing that it's connected to a cosmic crisis. That, 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 you know, that is, it's not a matter of if, if he were a good, you know, good boy scout and was faithful to God and country, that everything would be okay. No, it would not be okay because there's this, this wicked twist in the fabric of reality which moves us to cry out to God it's a cosmic crisis. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. The Lord is at work. The Lord is always at work. Even in the midst of our sin, even in the midst of our foolishness, God is there. What is God doing? He wants to teach us. He wants to alert us to, to our foolishness, to our delusion, that, that we can live rightly apart from him. And so Paul says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. All things. And so, and so David is, is able to come and, and, and lay his heart out before the Lord because he knows that the Lord is at work, even here. Even in his violation of Bathsheba, even in his murder 
uh, of Uriah, the Lord is at work to bring him to a place. And then finally we get these this wonderful expression in, in 7 through 12. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and that hold me with a willing spirit. And we, he, we can hear David's deep longing. True recollection. I know I failed. I'm not making excuses. I know who you are. That you are just. That you are at work. Oh God, I need you and the fullness of you. Recollection. Taking the time to gather ourselves before the Lord. Which leads to contemplation, seeing into the heart of God. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Religious acts, the rituals, even the ritual of sacrifice, it's not what God desires. What does God desire? A broken and contrite heart. Why does God want a broken and contrite heart? Because he wants us. <laughs> he wants all of us. Open hearted. Who we are. How we are. Don't need, to put, don't need to polish the brass, right? Don't need to put a shine on it. This is who I am. And he loves us. And as we come to him with a, with a full heart, taking the time, especially at, the Lord, at his table, taking the time to invite him to, to, to search our hearts, so that we can gather ourselves in his presence. Not pretending. Not blame shifting. Honest. Authentic. Lord, this is who I am. The Lord says. I know. Draw near. And come to my table. So let's. Take a few moments. And especially, I, I think of Boko Haram. And we need to understand what Islam, what, what militant Islam is. Militant Islam are God fearers who are absolutely convinced that God is the highest value and that uh, what threatens the glory of God are people who are not submitted to him. Most Christians don't understand that quality of commitment. They are absolutely convinced that if the whole world would simply surrender themselves to God, everything would be okay. The, 
problem in the narrative is that they do it at the point of a gun. They're, they're thinking that they can, they can compel that kind of surrender, that kind of submission. And anybody who's ever raised a two-year-old <laughs> knows that'll never happen. You might be able to get them to do what you want them to do, but inside, they're not surrendering. Jesus does an entirely different thing. He comes, and he gives himself, empty, powerless, inviting the darkness of power and oppression of sin to come and do their worst. And they do. And the Lord invites us, come to me, who gave himself, not demanding anything, but a broken and contrite spirit that he will not despise. So in the silence, let's, I, I invite you to bow your hearts and heads before the Lord and, and just allow the Holy Spirit to search your hearts. Just to bring to mind, you know, it could, could be a short word with a spouse or one of the kids. You know, could be, could, could be some other rash act. Just allow the Lord to, to bring that to mind. and No excuses. As the Holy Spirit is, is present to you, just, just own it and allow the Lord to, to break your heart afresh. Lord, search our hearts. You know, the Lord said in his, says in his word that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. And so on the night the Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat of it, remember me. Then he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood, the blood of a new and everlasting covenant I'm making with you and with all people for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, remember me. Tony and Bill are going to come up and distribute the elements. Happily, the Lord has opened the gates of heaven and he invites all those who will desire to be in fellowship with him and one another to, to feast on, the, on his body and his blood. I invite you to take a, take a cup and hold it that we all might all partake together.
the body of our Lord. Take and eat. The blood of our Lord. Drink with thanksgiving in your heart. Praise the Lord. Boy, as, as we continue to you know, reflect upon the, uh, the persecuted church, uh, Boko Haram, the, uh, militant Hindus uh, in India, uh, uh, communist China, the ongoing war in, in Ukraine, well, let us continue to pray, resisting the temptation to grab a white hat against those black hats, especially as our election is coming up this Tuesday. We recognize the intensity of the divisive nature, you know, in, in our world, in our culture. Just, just recognize that that's a nasty animal unleashed in our time. And let's pray and let's love for his glory. So go from this place filled with his presence, filled with his power, and serve him for his glory both now and forever. Amen.